Welcome to CatCast, where we explore the mysteries of our favorite feline companions to help you gain a better understanding of your cats. We would love to hear from you. Please check out the CatCast website at www.catcast.org to find out all the ways you can contact us. Now, here's your host and personal crazy cat lady, Lee Emerson. Cat, I'm a kitty cat, and I dance, 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 and I dance, dance, dance. Cat, I'm a kitty cat, and I dance, 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 and I dance, dance, dance. Cat, I'm a kitty cat, and I dance, 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 and I dance, dance, dance. Cat, I'm a kitty cat, and I dance, 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 and I dance, dance, dance. Cat, I'm a kitty cat, and I dance, 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 and I dance, dance, dance. Cat, I'm a kitty cat. Hi, I'm Lee. Thank you for joining me for the very first episode of CatCast. It's my hope that you will learn a little something in every episode that will help you understand your cat better and maybe bring you guys a bit closer together. They say that knowledge is power, and I've found that the better I understand where my cats are coming from, the better and closer our relationships become. I want that same outcome for you. But where are my manners? I haven't even properly introduced myself. Like I said, my name is Lee Emerson, and like you, I love cats. I've had cats for literally as long as I can remember. Some of my earliest memories are in the company of our family cats. My dad was always an animal lover, and my mom is a patient woman, so we've always had a house full of pets. I can't tell you how many times my mother has been fed the old, he followed me home, can I keep him line? And she usually said yes. She's a cat lover in her own right these days. I'd like to think I had something to do with that, but I know that it was a special cat, a red tabby boy named Goofy, who captured her heart many years ago. I've had more fish, cats, dogs, guinea pigs, hamsters, rats, rabbits, and birds than I could shake a stick at if I were so inclined, and I've loved them all. But the cats have always enthralled me the most. They're beautiful and cute, domesticated but mysterious, graceful yet silly, and they're always 100% comfortable being who they are. And so, when cats talk to me, I watch and listen to what they have to say. If you do those things, just watch them and listen to them, cats will tell you exactly what's on their minds. The trick is in learning what to watch and listen for. Now, I'm not a cat whisperer, not by any stretch of the imagination, mostly because cats find whispering to be annoying. Seriously, though, I've just paid a whole lot of attention to cats. My cats, other people's cats, stray and feral cats, cats in the rescues that I've volunteered with, and I read anything of value I could get my hands on, so long as it has something to do with cats and has something to teach me. I plan on sharing this with you and hopefully helping you understand your cats better, too. Okay, enough about me. We should get started. Today's episode will probably be a little different than what will be our norm, since we're talking about so many different things, like that introduction. But on a quote-unquote normal episode, I do hope to be able to help you address problems you're having. So feel free to email me at podcast at catcast.org. Let me know as much information as possible, as well as if it's okay to share your email on the next episode, or if you would rather I just responded privately. Just remember that if you're having a particular issue, the odds are that someone else is having a similar problem too. So where should we begin? Well, the beginning sounds like a reasonable place. Today we're going to cover a briefish history of cats, from the evolution of the very first cats to how they became the pint-sized hunters we know today, and also how they have progressed with us throughout our history as well. We will look at how our history has changed them and how they have changed our history. We're going to start out by going back to some junior high school biology Don't worry, there's no pop quiz or anything, and I'll tell you everything you need to know. So you may remember a mnemonic called either KP comes on Friday, gets spuds, or King Philip came over for good spaghetti, or kids playing chicken on freeways get squished. Whatever you learned it as, it basically means kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And what it is, is it's taxonomy, the systematic classification for usually organisms. So we're going to use that system to break down exactly how the modern house cat is classified. So you start out with kingdom. Their kingdom, and ours, is animalia, the animals. 
They're multicellular organisms. They consume organic material, breathe oxygen, they can move, they reproduce sexually. So underneath kingdom is phylum. Their phylum is chordata, the chordates. And more specifically, their subphylum is vertebrata, the vertebrates. They have a backbone. Their class, just like ours, is mammalia, the mammals. They're vertebrates that have warm blood. They're amnias. Their eggs are laid or retained in the mother's body. They have hair, and they have mammary glands, so the females nurse its young on its milk. Their order is carnivora, carnivores. These are placental mammals that have teeth and claws that are adapted to hunting and eating other animals. They're split into two suborders, Philoformia, the cat-like animals, and Caniformia, the dog-like animals. Their suborder, obviously, is Philoformia. They're cat-like because they're cats. This includes the cats, large and small, hyenas, mongooses, civets, etc. Technically, the distinction between Philoforms and Caniforms is based on something to do with the middle and inner ear being encapsulated in bone, but that's really beyond what we're going for here. Typically, feliforms have shorter snouts, they have fewer teeth, and their teeth are more specialized for shearing meat, they're carnassial teeth. They're usually more carnivorous and are generally ambush hunters as opposed to caniforms being more omnivorous, they eat a bit of anything, and they're more opportunistic with their eating habits. Feliforms have retractable or semi-retractable claws, Uh, caniforms' claws do not retract, Feliforms are arboreal or semi-arboreal, which means they spend some or all of their time in trees. Caniforms are terrestrial, staying on the ground. Feliforms are digitigrade, walking on their toe tips. That's why they're so quiet. Caniforms are plantigrade, walking more flat-footed. So below that, you have the family, Felidae, Felids, or cats. They're highly carnivorous, typically having become obligate carnivores or hypercarnivores, requiring the nutrients of animal flesh to survive and thrive. Although they may ingest vegetable matter, it's usually in small quantities and is typically an emetic to help them throw up. Of all the 13 terrestrial families in the order Carnivora, the Felidae are the strictest carnivores. This can't be underscored enough. Cats need meat. Now, they also have a slender, muscular body. Their front limbs are strong for catching and holding prey. They have large canine teeth and powerful jaws for a strong killing bite. They usually have a fur pattern that lends itself to great camouflage. Add to these characteristics the fact that they walk silently on heavily padded tiptoes, and you have a truly deadly ambush predator. This is where the family splits into the big roaring cats the medium and small cats, and the extinct cats. Before we go into the differences between them, let's take a trip back in time to when the very first cats appeared. So 25 million years ago, during the Oligocene epoch, the first felids, or true cats, appeared. The Proalurus, first cat, was small, very compact. It was very little larger than a house cat, maybe 20 pounds. It had a long tail, large eyes, sharp claws, and teeth. The claws were at least partially retractable, and the Proalurus was at least partially arboreal or tree-dwelling. Its fossils were found in Europe and Asia, specifically Mongolia, Germany, and Spain. It gave rise to the Sudalurus. The Sudalurus, its fossils were found in Europe, Asia, and North America. It lived from, say, 20 million to 8 million years ago. It's the ancestor of all felines and pantherines, which are the large roaring cats, as well as the macherodont, the saber-tooth, or the classic saber-tooth cat like the smilodon. It's the one that you're used to seeing. Several offshoots evolved, most of which went extinct. Only the felines and pantherines persist. Being a hypercarnivore is not for the faint of heart. The pantherini... The big roaring cats are pantherines. That's the tigers, lions, leopards, jaguars, and snow leopards. They diverged from Felini about 6 to 10 million years ago. And this is where we come to the Felini. Cat in Latin. 
They're the small to medium-sized cats, except that it also includes the cougar and the cheetah. It includes 15 genera, including Felis. The genus Felis appeared about 1 to 3 million years ago. It's just the small to medium-sized cat species. They're found throughout most of Africa, southern Europe, and Asia. Their physical traits are a high, wide skull, a short jaw, narrower ears with a short tuft, if any, and no white spot on the back of the ear. Their pupils contract to a vertical slit instead of a round pupil, and this enables faster tracking during changing light situations. As it's currently defined, there are seven species in the genus Felis. The domestic cat, Felis sylvestris catus, or just Felis catus to his friends. The jungle cat, Felis chaus, is the largest of the Felis genus. The European wild cat, Felis sylvestris. This looks for all the world like a heavy, very angry looking brown tabby. Then the African or near eastern wild cat, Felis sylvestris libica. And this is the really good one. This is where our cats came from. It's their ancestor in the wild. It looks like a brown tabby, but with a very light body and really long legs. Then there's the black-footed cat, Felis nigripes. The smallest of the cat species, it's a small spotted cat with a round face and big eyes. Then there's the sand cat, Felis margarita, which is absolutely adorable. You really must Google sand cat. And lastly is the Chinese mountain cat, Felis baietti. So around 12,000 years ago, that was the Neolithic period, the last part of the Stone Age, at around 10,000 BC, man's use of wild grains had evolved into early farming. He could purposely grow his food instead of scavenging whatever he could find. People started creating and using pottery to store their surplus food, which was a new concept, surplus food. Now, the dog had long since become man's companion, but man also began keeping sheep, goats, cattle, and pigs. Mankind started settling down in either seasonal or permanent settlements. Big changes were happening. Man's more sedentary lifestyle and more abundant food supplies meant that he was generating trash. You know who loves trash? Rodents. Three guesses who loves rodents? Cats. Cats were attracted to the new concentrations of prey. They started hanging out on the edges of society. There was probably an unspoken truce between cats and people, as the cat's predation of the rodents was mutually beneficial. Except to the rodents, of course. About 9,500 years ago, on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean, a person died. Okay, that's not a huge shock, all things considered. We don't know much about this person. He or she was about 30 years old and they were buried with their most prized possessions, and a cat. The eight-month-old cat, probably an African wild cat, was killed in order to be buried, but was not butchered for its meat. It seems likely that the cat was treated respectfully, and buried for either sentimental or religious reasons. So, here's the catch. Cyprus is an island, and cats aren't native to Cyprus meaning someone had, either purposely or accidentally, transported cats to the settlement. Was that cat domesticated? Probably not yet, but it also was likely not entirely wild anymore either. By this time, cats had spread from the Fertile Crescent, an area of the Middle East also known as the Cradle of Civilization, to other parts of the world, probably with a little help from traveling humans. Cats were likely very welcome passengers on ships, since they helped keep the inevitable population of ship-borne rodents under control. Wherever people traded, made war, or just explored, cats followed, or were taken along. It's impossible to say which without written accounts. And FYI, people didn't start writing down their adventures until about 5,000 years ago. Nearly 6,000 years ago, Archaeological evidence indicates that cats made their way to Egypt. Around 4,800 or 5,000 years ago, the first cat-headed deity, Maftet, appeared in Egyptian artwork. Bastet appeared about 4,900 years ago, 
originally represented as a woman with the head of a lion. By 4,500 years ago, we have the first illustration of a cat wearing a collar, a sure sign of domestication. This was left on an Egyptian tomb wall. By about 4,000 years ago, cats were definitely domesticated. They were commonly represented in Egyptian art and have become the most frequently mummified animal in Egypt. From about 950 B.C., Bastet gained in popularity and was shown with the smaller cat head that we're more accustomed to seeing for her. At this point in history, domestic cats were popular and highly respected. They were viewed as the earthly incarnation of Bastet, who protected households from the ravages of pests that ate their precious grains. They were purposely bred, often lived in temples, and when they died, they were embalmed, placed in tiny coffins, and buried in cat cemeteries. This was arguably the height of the cat's popularity, even by today's standards. For example, in the first century BC, Egyptian citizens were so outraged at a Roman for killing a cat that they lynched him, despite the pharaoh trying to intervene, and pharaohs were seen as living gods. In 30 BC, Egypt became a Roman province, and the cat party was over. The Roman Empire did not look kindly on the newest province's pagan worship. Over the next 400 years, Egypt's religious traditions were slowly outlawed. By 415 AD, the Christian church was given all properties once used for paganism. Although cats were still kept as pets and rat catchers, their heyday had passed. By the 12 to 1300s AD, cats were becoming increasingly associated with witches as familiars and the devil as the literal embodiment of evil. It was believed that the devil would transform into a black cat. The church began a systematic persecution of cats, greatly reducing their numbers just when cats were going to be needed the most. In October 1347, a dozen trading ships docked in a Sicilian port in Messina. The sailors aboard the ships were either dead or dying of a horrifying illness, the likes of which Europeans had never seen. The Black Death had arrived in Europe. Over the next five years, the plague would kill an estimated 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population. That's somewhere between 75 and 200 million lives lost in the space of five years. Today, we know that the bubonic plague was spread by infected fleas living on black rats. If you're wondering how it spread so far so fast, it may be helpful to know that the black rat is also known as the ship rat. Wherever ships went, they delivered the plague upon an unsuspecting population. If only they hadn't killed so many cats, the rat populations may not have spiked and provided such a lovely vector for plague-infested fleas. It took 200 years for the world's population to recover. So, on to the Victorian era. Things start speeding up a lot here. Alexandrina Victoria lived from 1819 to 1901. She was later known as Queen Victoria and she was an ardent animal lover and kept a veritable menagerie of pets. Thanks to her loving devotion, it finally became popular to keep cats again. The art of the period absolutely overflows with depictions of fashionable young ladies playing with their pampered kittens. Around this time, the 1870s or so, the first commercial cat food was introduced. Before the Spratz Company began producing ready-made food, Cats were fed table scraps, if they were lucky, to supplement whatever they were able to hunt on their own. In July of 1871, the first proper modern cat show was held in London. Although cats, unlike dogs, were not bred for different body types or jobs, there were already at least four varieties of long-haired cats and no less than ten varieties of short-haired cats. Such pure breeding has intensified over the last 150 years so that, currently, there are anywhere between 40 to 60 individual cat breeds, depending on which cat fanciers organization you reference. A few years later, 
Against the backdrop of the First World War, London was once again at the center of a step forward for cats. And dogs, too, this time. Animal welfare pioneer Maria Dickin was concerned about the dreadful state of animal care in the impoverished Whitechapel area of London. Although she had never trained in veterinary medicine, in November 1917, Mrs. Dickin established the People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, the PDSA, as a free clinic where the residents of London's East End could bring their sick or injured pets for treatment. It was an instant hit with EastEnders, despite being criticized by the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. Eventually, the two organizations, the PDSA and the Royal College, came to an understanding, and today the PDSA operates a UK-wide network of 48 pet hospitals, providing free and low-cost veterinary care to the pets of those in need. Mrs. Dickens' advocacy for animal welfare dragged the gentlemen of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, kicking and screaming, into a more modern view of pet health. So, at this point, cats were a respected part of our lives again. They were fed specially made cat food. There were even ultra-pampered purebred cats being shown and sold worldwide. And now they were receiving proper medical care. And yet, for all their respectability, they were still booted outside to, well, take care of their business. On a chilly January day in 1947, one Mrs. Draper of Cassopolis, Michigan, asked her neighbor, Ed Lowe, for some sand to use for her cat's calls of nature. Mr. Lowe's family business sold sand, sawdust, and granulated clay to factories and machine shops to absorb oil and grease. So he gave her some fuller's earth, which is a kind of clay that can absorb its weight in water. It worked so much better than sand or ashes that he decided to try to sell it. At first, people were skeptical about his newfangled kitty litter, but after giving it away and demonstrating how well it worked at cat shows, he founded Edward Lowe Industries, and the Tidy Cat brand was born. Well, there you have it. That's about 25 million years of natural history, from the very first felid to our sweet little lap cats. From the warm forests of the late Oligocene epoch, when Proalurus first appeared to that warm patch of sunshine by the living room window, cats have fought tooth and nail to get where they are today. In fact, most experts agree that the cat actually domesticated itself in true cat style, since we all know you can't make a cat do anything he doesn't want to do. I hope this gives you a better understanding of the ways in which cats have changed to enable themselves to become our companions, as well as how much of the wild cat is still in our goofy fur balls. It hasn't really been that long. Under the calm reserve of domestic cat at rest, the wild cat waits for the chance to stalk and pounce. Just wiggle your toes under the blanket and watch the laser-like focus as your cat's instincts kick in. Thank you for listening to this episode of CatCast. For more information, connect with me at catcast.org. You can find all sorts of ways to get in touch with me there. This podcast is edited and produced by David Marghetti. You can also find a link to Steve Ibsen's The Kitty Cat Dance Song on the catcast.org website. You heard a clip of it at the beginning of this episode, and if you stay with me for a moment, you can hear the whole thing at the end of this episode. It's super catchy. And join me in two weeks for episode number two, where I go over the book, The Lion in the Living Room, How House Cats Tamed Us and Took Over the World, by Abigail Tucker. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a great day. Well, I'm